Thank you, Caroline. Well, um, I'm pretty embarrassed now <laughs> with your uh, introduction. I mean, one thing I have to clarify, uh, I can't really speak French. I only know the bad words. Um, that's all I learned in the two years of being there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm so honored to be able to share my story with you all here. And um, one of the reasons that I decided to come to Trinity was because I heard there was a ministry um, of uh, Mosaic Ministry where is centered on reconciliation. It's one of the reasons why I decided to come to this university. So I'm really honored and um, glad I can share my story from Japan to everyone. Um, can you all see the PowerPoint? Okay, it's yes. working. So I'll go ahead with my self introduction. Um, not much because Caroline did like most most of it. So uh, briefly, I don't I don't know why I put this picture, but as Caroline mentioned, so. Uh, I play guitar and um, this is the before and after picture we have right here. And this is before when I was um, 18, I think 18 or 19, I used to be like a, 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 how do you call it? Like a guitar guy. Like, And then I got invo involved with uh, university and um, uh, well, I was a kind of a Christian back then, but I it's like a before and after uh, of my kind of a conversion experience that I had in the, and now married to uh, you. We came to America last um, January, so it's been a year and almost a half since uh, we are in Trinity. And it's been a pretty crazy uh, journey. Um, when we got here in January, it was before COVID, two months later, COVID hits and everything is online. So it's been a pretty peculiar journey for me and my wife here in America. And um, as Caroline uh, introduced, I used to be a staff member at KGK, which is InterVersity Japan. And I also um, I also now serve uh, in the FIS. And we uh, thank you, uh, Mosaic Gathering, for partnering with us in this initiative last week, where we had all these different um, country groups, ethnic groups from campus. We were able to celebrate the diversity and richness we have on campus together. And that was such a beautiful time. Thank you for uh, partnering with us. And also I, I serve um, with uh, Lausanne movement. Maybe you, uh, you're familiar with this movement, but it is a movement of um, leaders from all over the world. Um, it is centered on a mis mission of God. And I lead, um, well, I, I mean a council member of Young Leader Generation Group in Japan. And I'm also involved in the Christian Forum for Reconciliation in Northeast Asia, which is a, a kind of like a forum where different church leaders from China, Japan, Korea, and other parts of um, Asia come together and speak about um, reconciliation because there are a lot of history among us and there are many things that we have to uh, reconcile. And that's where I met Chris Rice, who is uh, my um, spiritual hero. He wrote a book called Reconciling All Things. You might all know this book because I heard that um, you guys are reading this at one point in Mosaic. But um, uh, yes, I met Chris Rice in the forum and uh, we invited him to Japan as one of the speakers for our university um, gathering. And he introduced me to um, Peter Cha and the uh, Mosaic Ministry here in America. So that's how I came to know about uh, Mosaic in the first place. Okay, a little bit about our, my country, Japan. Um, you might know this already, but Japan is one of the most unreached people group in the world. So um, it's the, actually the second largest unreached people group in the world, apparently. And it's very unique because it has religious freedom and uh, missionaries are welcome 100%. So there is no persecution like the other lists. So when you see lists of all these unreached people groups, Japan stands out pretty strangely because it is, it is like the only country which is not persecuted, which has religious freedom, but is still um, one of the most underreached countries. So the population, uh, you can see that in churches, there's only about 8,000 churches in Japan and evangelical Protestants are about 0 0.4 or 5%. And which means um, there's one church for every um, 16,000 people. And the pastors over age 50 is 70%. Average pastor age is like 60 something. And uh, average attendance of church is 35 people. And so this is the situation of Japanese churches. Uh, it's very, very small minority. Christians are a very, very small minority. But um, even among this minority, there used to be a huge divide between the evangelical churches and the mainline, as it is, I think, in the rest of the world. Um, 
I grew up in a conservative evangelical church. I didn't know anything about um, uh, the mainline church, but there's a denomination called United Church of Christ Japan, which is the biggest mainline denomination in Japan. It's one third of all the churches in Japan, about 2000 churches. But um, there was no dialogue between them and there used to be a lot of hostility and a lot of suspicion against each other until um, this event happened, which I will, uh, uh, can you see the, is the sound coming up? Not yet. No, it's not. no sound? Oh, maybe I forgot to do the tick again. I always forget to click the little tick. Um, <laughs> okay, I will share again. A violent. Is the sound coming out? Yes. Okay, okay, good. I'll play it again. All across northern Japan, they felt it. A violent magnitude 9.0 earthquake on March 11th, 2011. It was centered about 80 miles offshore, and tsunami warnings went up immediately. In coastal cities, People knew what to do next, run to higher ground. It's from these vantage points on hills and in tall buildings that incredible footage was captured. In Kesanuma, people retreated to a high-rise rooftop and could only watch in horror as tsunami waves inundated their city, knocking buildings into rubble and mixing into a kind of tsunami soup filled with vehicles, building parts, and contents. Seawater cascaded over sea walls and into cities. This video shows the water rushing over an 18-foot seawall in the Kamaishi city. The seawall here was the world's deepest and largest, but not enough for the magnitude of the March 11 disaster. It was the largest quake ever known in Japan and one of the five largest recorded in the world. More than 28,000 people are confirmed dead or missing. When two tectonic plates push together under the sea, the resulting earthquake sends an enormous burst of energy up through the ocean, displacing enormous quantities of water. With the upward motion, a series of waves expands in all directions. In deep water, these waves travel fast, up to 500 miles an hour, but only reach a height of a few feet a passing ship might not even notice. But as the waves enter shallow waters, friction with the ocean floor lowers the wave's speed, but raises their height. This video is from a Japan Coast Guard ship confronting a tsunami wave in shallow water on March 11. And a rare view from the air video of a tsunami wave approaching the shoreline. In Japan, some tsunami waves reach as far as three miles inland. Japan may be the most seismologically studied country in the world, and with more than 1,200 high-precision GPS stations, a geophysicist at the University of Alaska used the data to create a visualization of the March 11 quake. The waves of displacement that you see were moving as fast as five miles per second. In this photo, the ripples of tsunami waves are seen moving upstream in the Naka River at Hitachi Naka City. New technology left an enormous amount of visual evidence for study in years to come and can perhaps help us better understand the power of earthquakes and tsunamis and prevent loss of life in the future. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, in March 11, 2011, a huge earthquake and a tidal wave hit the east coast of Japan, which led to a lot of um, death and uh, Sorry, 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 next slide. Yeah. If you look at this picture right here, um, this was a state of many cities in the coast areas of Japan when 
the tsunami hit, and I was a student back then. I was、um, in the fourth year of、um, maybe third or fourth year、uh, in my university, and me and my church and my campus ministry went out there、um, with a team to help out. But then when we got here, we saw this scene, and all these people standing there、um, with who lost their relatives, who lost their family members, just speechless. And we were so devastated going there, and、um, we met many people asking a lot of questions. You say you are a Christian, but why did God do this? Is this a judgment? Is God judging us? And、um, after receiving all these questions,、um, we thought we went there to encourage them, but we became very.、Uh, some members became very discouraged.、Um, we didn't know what to say. We didn't know what was the right thing to do, and. This event really、uh, moved me, and I ended up going、um, there. I think five or six times in total as a student.、And、then one thing, I realized one thing which really fundamentally changes the way I thought of about things, and that was when we went out there with a group of volunteers from churches. We meet different、um, church volunteers from different denominations, different churches. We went to this one city, and there was a Catholic group organizing、um, uh, relief work, and we had to work together. And then there are people, non-Christian people, who are living there, and they're seeing us, and they're asking us, "So you say you are Christians, but you are Protestant, and you you are Catholic, and what's the difference?" And they don't see us as different denominations, or they don't see us as in different theologies. They all see us as Christians, and they called us Mister Christ. Which we always had to um, um, tell them we're not Christ. We are Christians, but we don't call. Please don't call us Christ. But they kept telling us that you guys are all Christians. Why do why do you have to fight against each other? And when we were doing different relief works,、um, sometimes we were met with difficulty because some churches were doing one thing and some churches were doing other things, and we were not collaborating, and that led to some of a stress in the people there. They're like, all these Christians are coming, but they're like fighting against each other, and they're not really. Helping our initiatives, and that's when、um, many people started to see the need for collaboration.、It、kind of forced us to talk with each other and see what we can do with each other because it was impossible not to collaborate because we were all there, we were all there together to help out and to meet the needs of the people. So this whole event kind of forced us into a collaboration and also、um, dialogue with each other. And this event led to many、um, uh, different initiatives that followed. So they didn't see us as Baptist, Methodist, Catholic person, but they saw us as Christians, and this really provoked us for a mutual dialogue. And this started an initiative called Grace, a Great East Japan Earthquake Theological Symposium, where、um, we had theologians from different seminaries in Japan. Um, evangelical seminaries, mainline Protestant seminaries,、uh, one from Catholic, and、uh, we have Leslie Allen here from Fuller Theological Seminary. But they all coming together and discuss about the implications of the earthquake and how, as Christians, we can collaborate and、um, help the people in need. And this、uh, symposium is still going on.、Um, last year there was the seventh, I think, symposium.、Um, they do this symposium every one year or every two years or so. And then after、um, this symposium, they came another initiative, which was Reformation 500 Youth Conference. So、um, maybe you all remember、uh, there was a 500th year anniversary of the Reformation, and that was after the earthquake hit. So it was after we were we started to have this mutual conversation with each with each other, with different denominations, mainline and Protestant together, and then. We started talking about how maybe there's some way we can do this together. We can do a youth conference together with the evangelical churches and the mainline churches together to celebrate the 500th year of the Reformation. And this is something that has never happened in the history of Japan before. I mean, evangelicals and mainline they used to be doing their own things and they never talked to each other. But then we have this、um, pivotal moment in history when we were able to get. These different、um, competing churches together to do a youth conference in one of the biggest universities in Japan called Aoyama Gakuin, one of the biggest uni Christian universities, mainline Christian university in Japan, 
and we feel about 2,000 students there, half of them evangelical, half of them mainline students, and we had a youth conference. And um, the speakers there, these were the four speakers. Um, the first speaker is from uh, United Church of Christ Japan, who is from a mainline denomination. The second speaker is my boss from University of Japan. His name is uh, Oshima, and he's an evangelical pastor. And the third speaker, he's actually a Catholic priest. And the fourth speaker is from a, a, a mainline Lutheran denomination. So we had these four uh, speakers preach their younger generation from very, very diverse settings, very, very theologically diverse settings. And we were all gathered here together to celebrate the 500th year of the Reformation. Even a Catholic priest was there. So it was such a, a peculiar moment in Japanese history. And also um, what happened afterwards was that I was invited. I, since I was one of the part of this initiative of the Youth Reformation 500th um, Youth Conference, I was invited by the mainline church to organize um, a worship event for their youth camp. So they had a um, United Church of Japan youth camp, which is the biggest mainline denomination of Japan. They never had youth camps before. It was their first initiative to do a youth camp because many of the youth, um, they have never sung praise and worship songs. Um, they only have an organ in church. So uh, they're not used to this kind of um, uh, praise kind of music. They're used to more of a liturgical style of worship. So um, the people in the United Church of Christ, they asked me, um, Mr. Kaz, can you organize like a worship event where we can um, uh, celebrate both aspects of liturgy and the worship music. And they asked me to um, ar arrange, if you know Martin Luther's song, um, um, what was that song uh, title in English? The the most famous song by Martin Luther. Uh, I don't know the English title. The Mighty Fortress. The Mighty Fortress. Fortress. Yeah, the Mighty Fortress. Yeah, Mighty Fortress is the guard. They asked me to do a rock version of that. <laughs> <laughs> which is like impossible, right? It's like, uh, you can't really do a rock version with the uh, three, three notes, but, <laughs> but this is, this is like a picture of when we're doing a worship together with the churches, uh, with the youth of the mainline churches. And it was a very interesting moment. And also I was asked to translate a book on reconciliation, um, especially in the theology of forgiveness, IVP reconciliation series on forgiveness forgiving as we've been forgiven from a mainline publisher. And also um, they asked me to write um, write an article, not an article, write a whole chapter on their um, guide. So the mainline denomination, uh, United Church of Japan, uh, United Church of Christ, they were publishing uh, Believer's Guide to the Apostles Creed. And they had this section, they had a chapter on forgiveness of sins. They're like, oh, um, Mr. Kaz, can you do this section? I'm like, I am not from, <laughs> your denomination, and I am probably in a very different theological tradition. Are you sure you want me to do this? And they're like, yes, sure, are you sure? And so I wrote a whole chapter on what it means for Christians to forgive and be forgiven from God. And I wrote this pretty much from a pretty evangelical conviction standpoint, but also incorporating some aspects of forgiveness, interpersonal forgiveness. And I was surprised, um, these things never happened in the history of Japan before, um, these kind of collaboration between the mainline and the evangelical church. And I don't think we see these often in the world as well. It's a pretty peculiar example, what the earthquake, um, after the earthquake, when everybody was forced to talk with each other and kind of work with each other, um, these uh, kind of things start to happen. And even in my campus ministry, um, the mainline churches started to send their youth to the university campus chapters before we were seen as like heresies, before uh, evangelicals were tend to be seen as like these um, uh, people who don't have theology. And um, some people refuse, some churches refuse to send their uh, youth to the campus ministries we have. But after these initiatives, um, more and more people from the non-evangelical churches started coming to our campus ministry and many people uh, started to get baptized as a result of that. And so we saw all these, um, interesting things that God was doing after the earthquake. But then also um, this brought a lot of um, difficulty as well, because when people with different theological perspectives or different traditions come together, there's always problems, right? There's always things we need to untangle and there are pressures on both sides that they wanna kind of 
pull each other to one end or another. And there was so much chaos there. And some of the students in the in the university um, campus chapter, they they kind of protested against um, this cooperation with the mainline church. There were some students who were worried that we were collaborating with the mainline church and there was all these debates going on. So there were so many things we need to navigate through. And there was so much of the bridge building that we had to do for the gospel to um, bear fruit in Japan. And I wanna share um, a couple of things that I learned um, with some of the ways that, um, and through many of the mistakes that I went through um, when we were attempting to build these bridges. So this is not some, this is not like, a, I don't want you to think of this as like a teaching, but more like a testimony of how I tried to navigate different theological differences to make a bridge between these um, different groups. So the first thing I learned was we need to change the metaphor of arguments. This is a quote from Deborah Tanner uh, in the book, Stopping America's War of Words. And she says this, we need to find metaphors other than sports and war. Smashing heads does not open minds. We need to use our imaginations to find ways to seek truth and gain knowledge through intellectual interchange and add them to our arsenal, or should I say to the ingredients of our stew. So I think we are kind of enculturated towards the model of dialogue, mode of dialogue called debate, especially in America, I feel, which is not a bad thing always. I mean, it's one of the strength which require, which is re required in academia, right? You need to kind of um, be able to defend your own arguments. But debate should not be the only mode of dialogue, I feel, especially in a setting where we need to be, there needs to be reconciliation. And as Deborah Tannen speaks about, I think most of the time our metaphors when we engage into dialogue or um, arguments is this. It's a metaphor of warfare. We need to decide who wins and who loses. And we are kind of fighting against each other. When we have different, we come from different culture, when we come from different traditions, different theology, when we come to the table, we speak against each other. We so use this metaphor of warfare where we need to uh, decide who is the winner. But as Deborah says, I really think we need to change this metaphor to this, which is cooking, or um, as she said, um, making a stew, right? When we think of cooking, we have two different parties collaborating together to uh, cook something. We are not against each other, but we're on the same side. And we have the same objective to create a good meal to enjoy together. And um, this changing this to this are uh, modes of thinking, modes of dialogue, I think is really important when we um, embark on our mission of reconciliation. And I think this metaphor of a preparation of a meal is very fitting. It's a very fitting metaphor for Christians because us Christians, we have a tradition of what is called the agape feast or a love feast. This is a picture um, of a, a catacomb uh, I forgot which catacomb exactly, but this was a picture that you, you will find that the persecuted churches drew in their um, catacomb where they hid. And this shows a tradition of a feast called Christian agape feast or what is called a love feast, which is um, mentioned in Jude one twelve as a love feast. And, he, and um, there are evidences of this feast in, for example, like a letter to um, Pliny the Younger to Trajan, um, a non-Christian who was investigating about Christianity, which he reported that Christians, after having met on sat on stated day in the early morning to adjust form of prayer to Christ, later that day they would reassemble to eat in common a harmless meal. So Christians, according to investigations of non-Christians who were trying to figure out what they, what kind of people they were, the early churches they were known to be people who ate together. <laughs> So Christians were known to be um, people who gathered and ate together. The Christian community was about eating, feasting, and I think, or as a foretaste of the kingdom. And I think we are losing this aspect of kind of getting together, feasting together, celebrating together in our individualized culture, especially in the digital age. But um, there's a really good book that I read recently called Charitable Writing, which talks about um, the purpose of a banquet is not to win. Banquets are celebrations. 
Ideally, all participants benefit from joining in. These benefits aren't simply material, but are intellectual and relational. Once again, in the ancient world, banquets was the ideal setting for the exchange of ideas and companionship. So I, first thing I learned was we need to change this metaphor of warfare into a metaphor of making a meal together in a banquet. And the second thing I learned was we need to get past closed-ended questions. How many times have you heard questions like, do you believe in A or B? Or do you think blah, blah, blah is biblical or not? And I was faced with all these questions when I was in a dialogue with people from different theological traditions. These open and uh, closed ended questions where we only have two options, yes or no, or A or B, these are not helpful in um, furthering the dialogue because closed ended questions are kind of designed to divide you into camps. It's kind of these questions are designed to put you, to categorize you into different camps. Oh, so he believes in this, so therefore he belongs to this category. Oh, he believes in this, so he belongs to this category. And it's kind of like a conversation stopper. And as um, uh, Dr. John Richardson, a professor of information studies in UCLA, he wrote this, closed-ended questions can be leading and hence irritating or even threatening to user and can result in misleading assumptions, conclusions about the user's information need. So we need when we are faced with these um, A or B type of questions, or when we ourselves ask these questions, we really need to be careful that we don't use those questions or we don't respond to those questions in ways that automatically puts people in different boxes. And I find Jesus to be like the supreme example of the best example of dealing with these A and B sort of questions. For example, so how did Jesus respond to these kind of divisive questions? Um, if you look at all the questions Jesus has asked, it's so interesting because most of the questions Jesus has asked was this kind of a close-ended question. Do you think A or B? Yes or no? But then Jesus never responds in an A or B manner. So, for example, in Mark 12, um, 14 to 17, Pharisees ask, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? A famous passage. Should we pay them or should we not? Yes or no? But then Jesus responds, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And he asked them instead, whose likeness in inscription is this? And they say Caesar's. And he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God's. And so Jesus kind of elevates the conversation um, away from the yes and no question and goes to a deeper spiritual truth. And he does this all the time about questions of divorce and other questions. Jesus never engages, never puts himself in an A or B camp, but he always um, asks questions about the questions and kind of go further into the spiritual depth behind the question. And I think we should um, kind of model Jesus in how we engage with these A and B kind of closed-ended questions. And also um, avoiding un unhelpful labels. I was uh, kind of brought in a tradition where I thought liberal Christians were non-Christians. <laughs> So I used to label all non evangelical as liberals and that world, well, that world used to be easy, right? It's either evangelical or all liberals. But then when I started to engage with mainline pastors and heard them talk about how to fight liberal theology, I was confused because I was like, I thought you guys were liberal, but now you guys are talking about how to fight liberal theology. <laughs> so that's when I realized these labels are very unhelpful and can be um, dangerous when we engage with each other. And recently I was on a social network and I realized that, um, I think you all know Tim Keller, but one of my friends, a very um, conservative Christian, he was talking about how Tim Keller is a Marxist. Then I see another uh, of my friend for, for was talking about how Tim Keller is a fundamentalist. I mean, you can't be both, right? So <laughs> this, this just shows how putting people into boxes is really not helpful. And I really think categories are important and category, categorization is fundamental to theology, but I think categories should be used not in a way to put people into boxes, but seen as a spectrum so that we can analyze what's going on instead of kind of putting things into different boxes. And Miroslav Volf, um, in one of my favorite books of all time, Exclusion and Embrace, he talks about a need for a Catholic personality. He defines this as Catholic personality is a personality enriched by otherness, a personality which is what 
it is only because multiple others have been reflected in it in a particular way. Distance from my own culture that results from being born by the spirit creates a fissure in me through which others can come in. The spirit unlatches the doors of my heart saying, you are not only you, but others belong to you too. So this concept of a Catholic personality centered in the identity of Christ, I think is really important. As Miroslav Volz talks about, when we have Christ as a center, everything else becomes peripheral. And this is kind of um, borrowing on Peter Chow's diagram of gospel-centered intercultural model, but I think we really need to have the gospel and we need to have um, identity as Christ, as Christians in the middle to see, uh, to be able to engage with different cultures or traditions. Oh, I already, I only have like five more minutes. So uh, yeah, a final uh, point was do the homework beforehand. I made so many mistakes in this area. First, in terms of tradition, when we first did a joint worship service together with the mainline and evangelical church, inviting some of our um, campus um, students, there was so much tension. And some students, um, I think we did uh, Teze worship. I don't know if you know Teze worship. It is a worship where um, you put candles and you pray a very, you pray, uh, it's very liturgical and you pray and sing this very short line over and over. It's kind of like this in the picture, but many of my students from campus ministry, they were not accustomed to this tradition and they thought it was heretical. And when the service started, they immediately um, bursted out of the room. And uh, I really repented for not explaining to them beforehand what it's all about. So I really think sometimes when we try to get together from people from different traditions, when we do that too fast, people come together too fast, they just bump into each other and creates a chasm, which is even bigger. So we really need to do a homework and learn about the traditions and their history and our history beforehand. This is what happened in the Arbana conference when Peter Cha spoke as a speaker. Um, I think it was Arbana 93, but one of the delegates, some of the delegates in Japan, they realized about um, the past oppression that they have done to the Korean uh, Christians and they went to apologize to the, the Korean students without having enough knowledge about the history behind it. And the Koreans, some of the Korean students asked them what, are they, what they are apologizing for. And the Japanese students were like, well, we don't really know what we are apologizing for, but we want to apologize. And uh, the Korean students were like, some of the students were actually offended by the fact that some, they did not know the history. So I think we really need to know the history and the historical facts of what was happening between the different groups in order to really be able to um, get in before we get into dialogue. And uh, we also need to know the language games as uh, philosopher uh, Wittgenstein talks about. There's so many different rules of language that's been used in different camps and same word can mean different things. So really need to know, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that word? Can you define that word? Can you define that term? really need to uh, do that um, to avoid uh, landmines and also have like a bridge building companion. I really found um, Bonhoeffer and Harry Now and uh, even sometimes Karl Barth really helpful as people who were bridge builders before us. So even if we don't know anything about their main theologians, even though they don't know our theologians, there are people in the border uh, who kind of were bridge builders before us. So when we, uh, they can be kind of they can really help us engage between different theological disciplines okay so um i think my time is up so one last remark um when we try to build bridges we get stepped on from both sides and it hurts and some people um when the pendulum swings when we get criticized i had a lot of uh, my friends who when they were trying to uh, embark on this mission of reconciliation they were criticized from both ends and some people lost faith in Christianity altogether, or some people um, stopped being an evangelical, evangelical altogether. So we really need to know where we are vulnerable and where our weaknesses are so that we won't make um, reactionary responses and <laughs> retreat or um, kind of make reactionary or ang uh, reactionary responses based on anger or sadness. We really, really need to know when we are hurt, uh, why we are hurt, when we are angry, and why we are angry. And as a final word, I think um, Luke 10 gives us a very important lesson. 
Um, if you read the narrative of Luke 10, there's a story of the Good Samaritan, a famous Samar uh, Sam famous parable there. It talks about um, Jesus telling his disciples to do the same. And this passage is used a lot for um, uh, activists or people who advocate for action. But then right after the parable of the Good Samaritan, we have the Martha and Mary story, right? Where Jesus tells uh, Martha that the most important, important thing is to listen to Jesus. So I think we really need both aspects, not only um, jumping into action, but really need to start from listening to Jesus and lamenting and praying to Jesus. And without that, we can't sustain a spirituality or reconciliation. And finally, uh, this is the last slide I have. Um, if you read Revelation 7, it is so encouraging because it's like a movie that we know the end already, right? We God show us what's going to happen in the end. And we're just kind of um, incorporated or we're just, we're just kind of assisting God, not even assisting, but we are being able to, um, we're invited into this task together. So if you read Revelation 7, verse 9 to 10, after this, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So this, brothers, this is the end. This is the final image. This is the goal that's already promised in Scripture. Reconciliation is not the work that we have to do. It's God's work that he's doing with us by using us. It is God's mission. So we just want to be comforted that we know where everything is going to. We have this end vision, and we're just so honored to be able to participate in his mission. So these are the three discussion questions I have, and um, that's it for my uh, presentation.